the radius. There is no better way than to start looking at the radius, but immediately informing about its relationship to Alma. Let's take a look at these two bones as they would fit into each other in a skeleton of the forearm. This is the right-sided radius. We also start seeing it from anterior direction and this bone will be defined also as the long bone of the forearm. Position of the radius is traditionally mentioned as being the lateral bone of the forearm, but it should not be forgotten that the radius and ulna form two pivot type of joints, the proximal and the distal radioulnar joints, through which radius will be able to produce pivoting movement which result in our ability to pronate and supinate the hand and together with it, of course, pronation and supination movement affects the forearm. The proximal radius is very interestingly shaped. It is almost in the per form of a perfect cylinder. On the radial head, we can identify two different articular surfaces. One articular surface, which goes circumferentially and covers 360 degrees of the radial head circumference, is designed to make a contact with the radial notch of the ulna, and around it we will have addition of the annular ligament of the radius, which will secure the radial head, making sure that it can produce pivoting movement, but it would be unable to move a distance away from the ulna. Second articular surface is seen on the very top of the cylinder. I hope that this video would be able to identify it as a slightly concave area and that is going to be articular surface through which radius will also establish the contact with the distal humerus, particularly with capitulum of the humerus. So that will form the radio humeral articulation. Immediately inferior to the radial head, radius will show remarkable reduced size and by doing this we can easily identify this part of the bone as the radial neck. We're still looking at the anterior aspect of the radial shaft and immediately inferior to the neck we're going to find very interesting and very prominent landmark which is named the radial tuberosity. The radial tuberosity is insertion point for the main tendon of the biceps brachii muscle, which we mentioned in the previous section about the ulna. Biceps brachii is a muscle which principally is going to be involved in supination of the forearm, and once it reaches the end point for supination, the rest of the bicipital contraction will be directed to assist the brachialis as a strong elbow flexor. This part of the bone is insertion for the main tendon of the biceps brachii muscle, that is the radial tuberosity. Interestingly enough, if we place right-sided ulna immediately next to the radius, one can see that both radial and ulnar tuberosities are practically at the very same level. This is the radial tuberosity, this is the ulnar tuberosity, insertion of brachialis, insertion of biceps brachii muscle. Radial shaft. It appears to be slightly more flattened compared to the shaft of the ulna, so we can easily identify two different surfaces of the radius. The one that I'm currently pointing out is the anterior aspect of the radial shaft, and then if I rotate it by 180 degrees, we're going to see quite similar appearance of the radial posterior shaft. There will be a third surface which only has a very limited value for easier identification of the muscles of the forearm and their origin, which is considered to be the lateral surface of the radius. On the shaft itself, once again we would have one extremely sharp margin that is oriented towards ulna, and of course it bears the same name. It is known as the interosseous border or interosseous margin of the ulna. Let us again put quickly right-sided ulna into place and we can verify that interosseous border of either of the two bones actually faces into each other 
making sure that interosseous membrane will be attached practically to the same landmarks of two different bones, making sure that connection between the radius and ulna while forming proximal and distal radio-ulnar joint is nicely secured by presence of interosseous membrane. The distal radius. It has been mentioned at the end of previous video about the ulna that role of the radius is far greater to assemble the radiocarpal or wrist joint than the ulnar role. That's why we can see that the distal radius shows quite a massive expansion almost having a shape of a pyramid which is quite massive and we can see here on two different aspects of the bone that radial, distal end is going to produce two different articular surfaces. One that we can see now a little bit better is on the very distal end of the bone and here we can identify two different articular surfaces for two bones of the proximal row of carpal bones. One which is more laterally, that is articular surface for the scaphoid, and the bone which comes next to the scaphoid in the proximal row of carpal bones is the lunate bone and our distal radius will have articular surface for it. On the medial side of the bone, we can find third articular surface and that one will be in contact with the head of the ulna. This is the ulnar notch of the radius. Ulna has the radial notch, radius has the ulnar notch. At this point, radius and ulna will form the distal radio ulnar joint. Just like ulna, we're going to have same type of projection oriented more inferiorly except it is less prominent but it is also bearing the same name it is called the styloid process of the radius. I want to show you a little bit of a difference because the anterior aspect of the distal radius is quite smooth naturally because multiple tendons of anterior forearm or flexor muscles will have to pass and engage within the carpal tunnel that will be formed between carpal bones and the transverse carpal ligament. On the posterior side there will be also a similar situation where multiple tendons will need to cross the distal radius but because they would not get engaged in any form of canal or tunnel practically they will have to be secured in their position by offering a couple of grooves through which these tendons will advance from a distal inferior forearm onto the hand and of course we're going to have here additional connective tissue structure which is known as the retinaculum extensorum that will cover the extensor tendon tendons and will keep them secured and in a position regardless what type of action these muscles are producing. Usually one of these ridges becomes quite prominent and it's frequently named a Lister's tubercule which could be palpated also on the back of the wrist. In addition to what has been previously said about the radius, I'd like to add here one little tiny landmark which is sometimes mentioned in anatomy textbooks but occasionally it's also omitted. It is called the oblique line of the radius. Oblique line, it is sometimes quite difficult to see it because if a person during the life was not particularly muscular or was not using musculature of the forearm, that landmark could be quite invisible. But oblique line generally runs from radial tuberosity, then runs diagonally across the anterior surface of the bone and blends into anterior margin of the radial shaft. So if we're to describe it and to define it, it goes from radial tuberosity, then obliquely across and it blends into anterior border of the radius. Proximal radius and ulna together with distal humerus. Trochlear humeri, capitulum humeri radial head and trochlear notch. However, because of the humerus we are unable to see the notch, we are only able to see the coronoid process 
as the trochlear itself got deeply engaged within the trochlear notch. To complete the presentation of radius and ulna, one will have to illustrate them together. So here we're seeing the proximal radial ulnar joint and we can see that the radial head has engaged itself into radial notch of the ulna. Of course, around the radial head there will be a presence of annular ligament of the radius, which will make this practically 360 degrees socket within which the radial head will reside. Inferiorly, two bones form the distal radio ulnar joint, and I'm just trying to position them in front of the camera. So here we have the ulnar head with its styloid process, bone on your right side, which got into ulnar notch of the radius, articular surface. When these two bones perform the movement, it is considered that ulna is the stationary bone, and then radial head producing pivoting movement, as well as the distal radius pivoting around the ulnar head, will lead into movement that will actually allow the radius that temporarily crosses the ulna and these two bones will be losing for a moment their parallel run. Of course, when the opposite type of movement happens, which is supination, radius will unwind itself from pronated position and two bones of the forearm will resume and assume their position, which is considered anatomical, parallel to each other.